Good. Well, thank you for coming. And uh, yeah, hopefully we've got some interesting things to say. So, so really my, my talk has two parts. Um, there's a sort of a history, I think, of where we got today and some thoughts from me on it. And then hopefully we can talk about options and discuss things. Oh, fair enough. Really Fit everything the, on. Uh, the, uh, the oh well, what fun! It's probably on my slide, actually. You know, I probably just pasted it in the middle. <laughs> no, okay, fine. Let's let's uh, let's try and uh, play with the settings. Why not? It's always fun. It's not. It's okay. Fair enough. Yeah, we probably missed the full stop on the end, but it, it it's it's probably okay. S key. Okay. Perfect. Anyway, you can be assured that the left-hand side of the logo looked a lot better when we could see all of it. So uh, there we are. Perfect. So, so this is some sort of um, history of online and uh, how we got here. But so, see, so there's quite a bit of prehistory, sort of before history began. So, so a long time ago, I, I went to see these people in Hamburg that had a thing called Star Division and. Uh, and I can't remember quite when, but Quaylorn probably knows all of the answers here, and so I'm, I'm relying on him to, uh, to tell me. Um, anyway, they, they'd created this beautiful ActiveX control that ran in the browser and talked to your Sun workstation. And they called it Star Portal. And it seems to have died as if it never was on the internet. You can't find pictures of it, at least I can't. Um, but I remember seeing it. Did you see it, Quaylorn? You, you, yep, yep. It, was, it did exist. Uh, and, yeah, yeah. Yep, quite almost shiny when he was being interviewed, so it, it must have existed. And uh, it talked to a Sun server, which was great, because you could sell lots of Sun servers, and ultimately Sun was a server company, so that was kind of useful. And there was lots of Uno-ness to go, so they used Uno as the remote protocol for that, and they did a whole lot of uh, async stuff to make one-way methods work and try and make that perform without too many round trips. And they brought it up, and it, yeah, it worked. You could, you could edit in your browser, you, you did need an ActiveX control running under Windows, which is a slight downer. Um, but, but anyway, the technology as, as it was, was was quite impressive. And some of the underlying things there uh, actually were then subsequently contributed to LibreOffice, as I understand it. So, yeah, so this Vigra and supporting libraries and this base BMP thing um, sort of all, all landed uh, in, in, in LibreOffice some, some years later. And our, our very own Torsten Behrens uh, was, uh, <laughs> was working on it, I guess, back in, back in the day. And, uh, and it lasted quite a long time. So BaseBMP allowed you to do your rendering and, and do your VCL rendering at the bottom of, of LibreOffice in, in a way that looked the same as X or anything else. Um, but without needing a graphic display service, you could run it on the server side better. And yeah, I mean, like, I guess Quaylon and I, well, I, I started, made a mess of it, and uh, then Quaylon finished it beautifully. But the GTK3 port ultimately uh, brought Cairo, and in the end, we could get rid of base BMP, which was just a, a massive celebration. Was very, very helpful. And uh, yeah, and sort of, uh, and some of this uh, Vigra and some of this other, other stuff that was supposedly so efficient but with templates, but, but turned out not to be. And, uh, but it's still there in Apache Open Office. If you want to see relics of software engineering, you know, uh, and how it used to be, you can see it there now. Um, so, uh, and then there was an SVP plugin, which I guess sat on top of that. So this was the headless plugin um, that used this, this infrastructure, graphics infrastructure underneath. And uh, Quaylorn sort of did this quite small commit, frankly, to, to the headless, <laughs> headless module, going, oh, I'm going to do all this stuff. And uh, in response, uh, I guess Sun open sourced their, their VCL plugin at the back end, the SVP code that today is the basis of the GTK3 and 4 and you know, the headless uh, work that we use. And so they open sourced that and contributed a huge amount of code uh, to, to doing that. Um, so thank you, Sun. Absolutely excellent. Um, yeah. Um, so then, of course, well, a little bit later on, uh, we announced the idea of the Document Foundation. And you may or may not recall uh, the, these times, but um, one of, the, one of the things that was happening at the time is that Oracle was trying to make an online uh, collaborative office suite. And so that's pretty sticky. You know, it was proprietary. It wasn't op open source, but it was, it was CSS and JavaScript and so on. And so it was really important that we at LibreOffice had a good story, if not, if not 
a product, we at least, you know, there was a vision, there was a direction. And, you know, we, we live in a tech industry where direction is very important, you know, having, a, having being perceived to have a plan and a future is, is arguably more important than, than having it. So, yeah, so uh, for the Paris conference, there was uh, quite a large amount of hackery from me um, at the time at SUSE to get the first GTK3 port working. So all sorts of Cairo rendering, uh, damage tracking, clipping, handling, the mess there. And uh, yes, GTK, extensive exorcisms. I, I cut and paste encoding is terrible, but, but we had to take something and we, uh, we did that. Uh, but this is my commit, you can go and see it at the, b the bottom of the stack. Um, and, and one of the things there was to have something to demo to a potential government investor in Paris who could have helped fund you know, all sorts of online stuff and LibreOffice and so on and so on. Unfortunately, like so many customer pitches, it never happened, but uh, at least there it was. And Sousa helped support me uh, doing that, which is good. And so here, here actually my, my slides from the first, first LibreOffice conference, and you'll discover there's actually still a bug here. This is quite annoying, where, I don't know, and I, I've tried to find this bug many times. It, it won't come back if I don't do it without projecting. <clears throat> anyway, we used GTK3 and Broadway, which is built in, and... It was amazing. You could run LibreOffice in the browser, and for the f first time, uh, first time ever, and that code is still there. You can still run, I, I expect you can still run, a LibreOffice in the browser um, using GTK Broadway. And we got screenshots like this, uh, which may look familiar for anyone who's played with WebAssembly. It, uh, there may be a feeling of deja vu, but, but rest assured that this was only 10 years ago, and uh, we've got something really product ready now. So uh, anyway, but uh, so, so that, was, that was quite fun. And uh, you know, here, here, are the, here are the conclusions. You know, it's a prototype, blah, 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 it's all in public gear, you just do this. And you know, obviously Alex Larson at Red Hat did the GTK Broadway piece that made that actually possible. So that's all good. So, um, <clears throat> so, so but the problem is also at the time, there was a, there was a, there was a company called, I think, Android, you know, I don't know. They made an Android Apache Open Office thing. I can't recall what it's, what it's, what it's called. Android Open, uh, Android. And open office, says Candy. Yeah. And so again, you know, perception is really important that we are the ones with the cool, cool we are the cool kids that have the cutting edge uh, stuff in, in this case. So, so we spent a lot of very heavy lifting work. I mean, Tor did a lot of work uh, here underneath. I was there very, very late with Candy, I think at a FOSDEM, um, hacking on this uh, the night before, trying to get something that was actually demoable and worked in the Android viewer that we could show to the assembled masses of hackers uh, at FOSDEM. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, so we managed to get not only LibreOffice in a browser, but something on Android that, that predates uh, TDF. <clears throat> and, and we showed it to people. I, I, think I, have a, I think I have a picture of it somewhere. Okay, in a, in a minute or two. Um, and I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, subsequently, February, uh, late after FOSDEM, TDF was, was founded, I guess. But interestingly, before even TDF existed, we have had an online uh, a version and, and an Android thing. And we'll look at that in a second. So at the same time, we had a great programming story about reusing the code and how easy it was to use Uno, and Uno was great, and you could remote control LibreOffice and so on. But I was pretty convinced that this was really not easy to do, and you had to lo have lots of libraries and things and link stuff that wasn't really installed in the system, and, 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 it was a nightmare. So the theory was great. Shoot, yeah, yeah. are you heckling? A notification from whom? That's the thing. What did it say? Uh -huh. Gokai, oh right, is he uh, telling me all sorts of interesting things that I shouldn't know? Yeah. Um, one second, one second. I might uh, need to just uh, disconnect and d turn off my notifications. Was it some deeply personal something or other, or is that uh, you know? You, know, didn't know. See you didn't see it. Well, there you go. You're right. You're You're right. Right. But thank you, Gillem. You know that's that's very very good of you. I'm sure there's all sorts of interesting things I should keep up with while I'm uh, pre presenting. Uh, okay. Aha, uh -huh, perfect. Anyway, LibreOffice Kit. I, I will get there in the end. It'll probably take a second to re, re, resynchronize. So, so the, the thought was then that we should make it much, much easier to reuse LibreOffice. And so I created a thing called LibreOffice. Well, at the time, it was called Lib LibreOffice. You can see my marketing skills were, you know, <laughs> absolute innovation there in, in marketing. Um, 
Luckily, in the end, there were so many kits. There was package kit and system kit and foo kit, whatever, that, that even I decided that a better name would be LibreOffice kit. So that we renamed it eventually. Um, but the idea here was that you have a header-only C library. So you didn't need to include anything. It was all in the box. And you just you would link this thing, and then you could suck goodness out of LibreOffice. And initially, we used this for LOConf. So, so the first customer wanted to convert files, and they didn't want to know anything about LibreOffice. They just wanted a small binary that could convert files. And do that in process and manage it rather than managing an SOffice shell script that ran an SOffice binary and something and something. And, so, uh, and, and they got some really good speed wins from that, which is cool. And we have this just this, this hook, LibreOffice kit hook, and we DL sim and load it, and all was good. So, ah, here we go. Aha! So another blue slide. I, this bug really irritates me. Anyway, I, one day I'll get it fixed. Um, yes, yeah, so, so this is a, a FOSDEM. I was, I was talking about the future and, you know, all of this, you know, the future is, you've got to worry about the future a lot. Um, so this is 2012. Uh, this is a quote, uh, you know, directly from, uh, in the future, cloud computing will be the only choice, you know? So, uh, so there you know. Um, Successful businesses may soon have no chief executive, no headquarters, and no IT infrastructure. It's amazing, isn't it? I don't know what they're going to do. But anyway, this kind of thing was, you know, I mean, like, yeah, cloud hype. Before that, grid computing, etc. I'm just wondering if anyone here today has presented using an online office suite from their laptop. No? Ah, life, you're, you know, brilliant, brilliant. But at least I think, you know, like the... That one out of you know <laughs> thirty. My 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 expectation is that we have plenty of time left before this vision occurs. You know, and maybe it's never. Um, so yeah, and, and this this is a quote really that's probably quite uh, useful to bear in mind. Um, but if you look at how Microsoft strat you know built their product strategy around online office, they essentially duplicated. Well, they rewrote the whole product, created something totally different that runs on the in the browser and started rewriting stuff left and right. And this is just a recipe for institutional failure, you know. Uh, actually, and, and, well, anyway. And, and you can see many examples of companies that have failed. But anyway, I talked about how we're reusing code and the web UI and the traditional UI and the Android UI. And anyway, 95% of code shared. Numbers still pretty much the same today. Shipping out of the box in LibreOffice 3.5. You see, that was uh, the Broadway stuff. So, and this was, oh yeah, this was our prototype. We were up there late, working on, on late at night, you know, swapping buffers and GL stuff. And, you know, this is as good as it gets on Android. You know, this, is, uh, this was, these were great times. Anyhow, um, eventually, um, other people inside SUSE got wind of the fact that there was one department in SUSE that was having all the fun. And, um, you know, writing Android apps and doing stuff in the browser. There was nothing to do with kernels and operating systems and so on and so on. And uh, when the inevitable... <laughs> You know, I mean, Novell went through a lot of rounds of, of layoffs. You know, we, we would regularly fire, uh, you know, 5% of the company every year. And the real trick was to not be in the 5%. And, of course, so, so the, the criteria there, I think, well, and, and they got dif different management. They were more competent, arguably, and, and realized that we weren't making enough money. And so they spun us out, uh, which, was, which was great. So, yeah. So finally free, you know, woohoo, to do exactly what our customers want, you know. Uh, so there you go. That's, that's the life of, uh, of being free. And, but the good news was that Cloudon signed up. So Cloudon had a real problem that they had brought Microsoft Office to the iPad. And this was awesome. Um, but they did it by running Microsoft Office in virtual machines on Windows servers in the cloud and then streaming it as an H26175 video or whatever uh, to, the, to the iPad which actually worked, and, and it, it, did, it did it really quite well. And then they did a bit of uh, you know, stuff on the top. Uh, but the problem was this relied on an interpretation of Microsoft's Office licensing that was susceptible to question. And also uh, pricing and, you know, uh, you know anyway, they, they were a massive Amazon user, a uh, resource user. Um, so that went south uh, pretty, pretty um, aggressively for them. And uh, when that happened, they needed a product, and they were a startup with money. And so anyway, the good news was, they picked on LibreOffice to build uh, their iPad thing. So I guess this is probably another rather prominent uh, LibreOffice technology user. And they engaged Calabra, the new, new company, and Miklos did amazing interop work for them. That's we're still enjoying. And uh, Tor and, and Andre Hunt and various other people did, did work with me to, uh, to get tiles rendering. And they built a very, a very nice tile rendering app on, uh, on iPad proprietary. Uh, but there, there it was. And it was a good time back in 2014. A similar time, Smoose was like, yeah, yeah, but what about Android? We can do something good on Android. And so this, this 
Smoose is, is probably, I think, was run by a sugar daddy with, with large amounts of money. You know, it's like one of those, we should do something good. And so he did, did, did do something good. Uh, and they funded, essentially, the LibreOffice viewer application for Android. So again, they came to, uh, to Calabra, and we basically took the iPad work we'd done for Cloud on, and we reapplied that uh, LibreOffice kit work to, on top of Mozilla's Fennec library, which was a tiled renderer for the web browser, to make um, a the first LibreOffice viewer application for Android. And that's the foundation of the code you still see in the Android uh, directory uh, there. Um, and of course, we credited lots of people, like SUSE had done a whole load of things in cross-platform support, Google Summer of Code people have done things, blah, 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 blah. Egalia did some stuff, I think, with, with, with TDF, ultimately. And um, of course, Mozilla provided a Fennec. So, and, and there you can see, it, it looks better than the previous demo. I think we can agree. Um, and ultimately, TDF then funded the Android editing work. So this was to take the, the smooth SUSE, whatever thing, and add to the LibreOffice Kit API, the ability to edit, um, which involves adding a whole load of events and driving, driving the core uh, like that. And this was a good time. We were on a roll. The slight downer is that CloudOn were acquired by Dropbox uh, and exited LibreOffice hard, really hard. And one could, if one was a paranoid speculator, note that they also had a large agreement with Microsoft uh, to bundle Dropbox into uh, Windows and so on. But there you are. Um, so, one of the things that we, we also, and this is, I guess, another, another reuse of it at the time, was to try and get LibreOffice used in uh, GNOME more. Um, we like to uh, encourage people to use our technology everywhere. Um, so, for viewing arbitrary uh, documents, we started to add these viewer widgets so that you could then embed LibreOffice inside a, a much simpler UI, you know, just for viewing a doc, like a PDF viewer, but one that actually renders and loads the document. So, again, uh, I think Cal Calabra did that, I think, out of the goodness of our hearts and because we thought it was good to help, uh, to help uh, you know, entrench the technology, let's say, in the, in the mindset of, of GNOME people who, 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 I mean, everyone thinks it's easy to write an office suite, but until they, until they actually get going and they see what Microsoft did and they have to interoperate with. Um, so anyway, we, we, we pushed that uh, underneath uh, parts of GNOME. And I don't know if it's still there. Is it still there, Quaylon, GNOME documents? The capacity is still there. Yes. <laughs> if you install the package from the deep dark behind the tiger, whatever. Anyway, good. Fair enough. So at this time, we, we, we'd managed with our, our, our little demos and our totally broken stuff to find another investor, which, was, which is even more exciting, in, in the Czech Republic. And they, they had real problems trying to get Microsoft answering their, their, their emails and you know, it be, being interesting at all uh, in, in helping them. Uh, and so they couldn't integrate with Office 365 or Office Online, and they made a mail client. That was their primarily their thing. And yeah, anyway, so we worked together to uh, to do some great work there and bring uh, LibreOffice Online into the browser, and, and and that work really was, yeah, initially funded by them. Although they they left, I guess, in in 2017, and then Calabra took that and and really you know uh, carried it on uh, hugely. Um, and then what happened? I mean, these are just some dates. So OwnCloud got involved, so we signed a partnership to embed in, in OwnCloud and have them promote uh, Collabor Online. As soon as NextCloud was founded and, and split out in, in 2016, we had a partnership there. And then lots of versions, you know, new features, collaborative editing. I mean, you know, it took quite a long time to get collaborative editing working. Um, but yeah, and yeah, well, it does work. Uh, very nicely, in fact. 2017 code, yeah, pixel, pixel-based dialogues. So, so one of the problems was that it really was just a very simple text editor. You know, you could bold things and italic things. So there was a toolbar of options, but getting the the rich functionality out of the client and into the uh, browser was was tricky. Uh, and our first cut there was to bring all of the uh, all the dialogues as pixels. You know, like teleported dialogues into the into the client, and that was quick and easy, but brought problems. Of course, all the dialogues need to become asynchronous. Otherwise, when you launch one dialogue and then you have another dialogue, if you exit this one, you can't actually exit it until the stack unwinds back again, which is, which is a bit of a nightmare. So, you, so you, you couldn't really bring all dialogues, but you could bring those that you had tweaked at some length. So we're still, still on, a, on a mission uh, to make more things asynchronous, and we're thrilled to have uh, Allotropia helping us with our mission uh, because in the world of WebAssembly, um, if you block the main loop, you die. So, and you have only one threat, uh, which is which is sexy. Um, but it does mean that everything has to be asynchronous. You know, well, there can be no state, there can be no functions calling others that last a long time. So it's a nice, nice sort of overlap there in um, in that. And the code has been slowly 
you know, moving in this way, I suppose. And perhaps C++ closure is getting standardized at a sensible time, helpful as well. So then, you're trying to make the rendering prettier, adapting to high DPI, you know, I, there's just an unbelievable amount of engineering effort required here. You know, I think of Kendi doing, you know, trying to get high DPI rendering and tiles to join and not having pixels that are offset and misaligned and just the designer, it's re really something of an absolute nightmare. And getting basic mobile support. So at some stage, I, I don't think I mentioned our rather large uh, customer um, that uh, helped bankroll, or not bankroll, demand, let's say, the, uh, the mobile version. But uh, at some, some point, um, yeah, we got a customer on iOS, and uh, yeah, so this was done with Avenis. So, so Avenis did, did a great job of, of, of selling uh, Calabra online. And they, they sold to a company, as I may have said before, that, that wanted an online office suite. And that's what was in the spec. You know, like when you're online, you have the office suite. <clears throat> Immediately after delivering it, they said, yeah, but we wanted to work offline as well. <laughs> nice. Um, so, and of course, there wasn't, there wasn't anything in that box. There was a sort of, by this time, dead uh, proprietary cloud on thing, but nothing. And there was the TDF Android uh, Fennec Mozilla thing, uh, but nothing, uh, which is written in Java. Nothing for iOS. So anyway, so we crunched to try and get a first version of that. We already had a slightly responsive UI that would respond to different sized screens. So we spent time making that work nicely on iOS, and we had a first version of it. Um, but this was really built completely from scratch uh, with online. And the idea essentially was to use a web window, you know, like all browsers, all, all, all phones now have browsers, which are used for all sorts of things. It's the, you know, quite a popular API, I guess. And, and so we would just embed Calabra online into a, into a browser on the device. And that worked well enough, although there are all sorts of interesting corner cases around keyboards and how you pop them up and how windows resize and copy and paste and you know lots of things at the edge of that are really tricky to get right but anyway we, we did some work so all was well we had an uh, android uh, an, an, uh, well we had an android version from tdf uh, repository that was made by smooth Sousa, tdf and, and various other people clabber obviously and we had an ios version which is which is great um, somewhere around then, it became clear that the thread-heavy model we had, so initially we started out with synchronous I.O. inside Calabra Online, which means essentially you do a write, and if you can't write because the socket is blocked or it's, you know, there's some problem, flow control problem on your internet, it just sits there and it hangs. And that's an easy way to write socket code. Uh, most people do that start, start with, but the problem is that if you want to do writes and reads at the same time and you know, uh, ad adapt to different bandwidth situations, you have to um, have multiple threads. So one thread writing, one thread reading, another thread managing what's going on, and, uh, you know, and that's per, per user that's connected to the document. And any computer science um, expert will tell you that threading is hard, with a capital H, and even, even good computer scientists screw it up royally, um, that's probably why. It should be software engineers. That's probably why. But anyway, um, so uh, it became clear uh, as we started to see some of the bugs caused by race conditions between different different users and uh, and things that this was just totally unsustainable. And this was on the eve of releasing our product as well. So there was this uh, crisis of should we meet the roadmap or should we rewrite uh, the whole way we do threading and I/O. And uh, yeah. So one of the exciting uh, decisions I made was that I have to go away and rewrite all of the threading and I.O. And um, yeah, and so we, we basically rewrote this all. So there's one thread per document. We had this astonishing realization, which maybe you, you ought to realize too, that at the end of the day, there is only one network cable coming out of most servers, right? And it doesn't matter how many threads you have writing to sockets at once, there's only one packet going to come out on the network at once. And actually sending a packet is mostly someone else's problem. You know, you hand it to the kernel and it can go and do something efficient. And so wouldn't it be nice if we had a lot less complexity and, you know, and we could actually reason about what was going on in the code. So anyway, so I, I spent ages and lots of overnight nightmares. And, and, and now we have something that's actually much easier to program on so, so users can get in and, um, yeah. I mean, like, it's, it's pretty simple. One thread per document. I, I argue it's simple. It's simpler, a lot simpler. You know. ah, so, so that was fun. Uh, what else? Android. Uh, why does that say Android at the top? Aha. Uh -huh. 
Okay, so so we also did code 4.2 at this point. So we, we tried to do a, a six monthly release cadence of some kind, and um, this added a whole load of, of sidebar things. We were getting there, and and because we could use the sidebar in in various ways on the client that we couldn't do dialogues with, and because we could use it on mobile by wrapping it into a new UI, we added a whole load of functionality to the sidebar. So one of the great great drivers for improving the sidebar, with like chart wizards and formula wizards and soon to be math, math formulae, you can go and see Mike's, Mike's talk on that. Um, uh, improvements and table editing and so on is driven by the mobile phone that we want a one hand UI so that you can wrap these things into the phone and then just use the functionality easily. Uh, so yeah, so lots of new features then in, in, in 4.2, both for mobile uh, on iOS and also on um, a desktop. And then, and then we really start our Calabra Office for Android. So this is essentially taking that iOS code and the Calabra Office, uh, Calabra Online core, and then just putting it inside a GTK, uh, what's it called, a WebView, I, I don't know, there's some horrible Java class. Kenny probably knows the name. Yeah, and uh, so, so that was essentially based on a completely refreshed approach. There's no Fennec, there's much, much less Java. It's really a WebView to a local cool WSD, wrapping that up just like iOS, so an entirely, entirely new um, chunk of code there. Now it lives in online forward slash Android. So after a while, and, and, and actually there was quite a big debate at this point, um, so my, my developers, uh, who shall remain nameless, were very much of the view that the TDF Fennec thing was the future, and the hard control of tiles and management of memory, and this, this was going to give you a better result, and it would perform better, and it would look better, and it should be better. And it's, it's an idiot's game to try and run a web browser on a mobile phone and debug it. And, you know, and well, yeah, it's, it's relatively tricky, but you can actually connect the Chrome debugger into the mobile phone and debug that thing there. And it works actually quite well, surprisingly well. For, if you're used to GDB, it's really surprisingly well. Um, so, yeah, but anyway, I, I said, look, sh sharing code makes more sense than some small performance improvement. So we did that. And ultimately, uh, I think I was vindicated. You know, in the end, the uh, TDF Android app was dropped from Google Play by TDF. Nothing to do with me. Um, and yeah, it's it was done quietly, which created some aggro, I think, in the community. And its reviews were really bad, and no one was doing anything. Of course, since then, Michael Weghorn has done actually a fair bit of work on it and, and quite some maintenance. So something like. I don't know, a magic 128 commits uh, have been done since December 2020, and most of those by Michael, I think, for Munich, who had some you know, strategic interest in that. So I think it's in a lot better state now than it was then, but at the end of the day, you know, it's not, not sharing development effort with lots of those other users. So, so then we come to the contentious political goodness here. Um, so one of the things that was happening in parallel here was that there was an increasing openness in, in uh, the board, like this increasing transparency, which was said earlier is probably a good thing. Um, and, and then th there was a vote that was proposed to essentially for TDF to ship uh, online by, uh, by Palo here. And uh, I'll get to the text of that in a second. No doubt we can uh, uh, talk about it later. Um, the problem with that, if there is a problem with that, is that we didn't really, lots of people in the community weren't aware of many things the board was aware of. So in terms of the, uh, the number of developers we had, how sustainable the project was, where we were going, uh, and this sort of thing, and, 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 and the problems of trying to attract developers and, and make the ecosystem work. So, uh, at the same meeting, Torsten and I, uh, and you can go and read the minutes of that, uh, tried to present a whole load of, load of things, starting with this. You know, the board, this is a literal quote from what we said and the minutes, wants to be more transparent decisions, that's good, we need to publish the data because it's no good making a decision in, in the wide community if the wide community doesn't really have a deep understanding of, of the background. I think that's intrinsic to doing things more openly. It just makes life, it makes marketing hard. And of course it was subsequently picked up by the register in, an, <laughs> in a quite an unfortunate way. And, uh, but I, I would argue that that is a, an inevitable consequence of sharing the facts of people or perhaps having an overly positive marketing. I don't know, I don't know who to blame, but you can blame me, I'm good at being blamed. Um, and then there was this vote on the proposal of Paolo, uh, 15, 15 minute discussion. Uh huh. 
So we'll look at that in a minute, but I, first I want to just look at why you might want to have bought Collabra Online in 2020-05. So these are basically the reasons why you might want to buy. Let me, let me go around this way. Um, and, and the reasons were simple. Um, so obviously you got support and SLA and product management. There's a lot of value in these. I don't want to diminish them in any way, but it's hard to ex harder to explain the value to people uh, versus a free, free alternative. Like, you know, these are good, but the cash is king, right? So we had various other things to um, apply moral suasion. So LibreOffice Online and Code would remind users this is unsupported. You need support, right? Like, you should, you should care about this piece. This is actually important. And so to, to avoid the impression it's suitable deployments enterprises, when you had something that looked like a big server, uh, this, this popped up. It didn't stop you using the document. It didn't stop you editing it. But it told you politely that you might want to consider you know, <laughs> you want to consider doing something else. And also, so, so you could get rid of that by buying Calabra uh, online. And you also had access to stable binaries. So one of the, one of the key uh, features, for example, of Red Hat is that RHEL, you know, is scarce. You can't get RHEL binaries unless you pay, right? I mean, you get the source code. Of course you get the source code. It's open source. And you can get Fedora. That's absolutely fine. That's out there and, and people use it. But in terms of getting the binaries of RHEL, you don't get them signed, whatever binaries, unless you pay. I think that's a very traditional and typical thing for distros. SUSE does exactly the same, you'll be pleased to know. So, uh, yeah. So, there were LibreOffice Online development snapshot images, but they weren't stable. They were there, you could get them, but they, they're not, not the bee's knees. And so, you'd also get Docker images, and you get build instructions and things to, to help you build your own Docker images. And you'd also get our documentation on installation setup and, and, and scaling, which was we, we published parts of, but was substantially closed at that time, okay? So then we look at uh, the, the vote as, as proposed, and this is just a copy and paste of the, uh, what was proposed. So this was the vote, um, 72 hours notice plus, I'm sure. Um, enable the infrastructure team to deliver the following packages with TDF and LibreOffice branding. Docker images, own cloud connector, so a branded, branded version of that, of course this is, was written by Calabra and own cloud. Uh, but rebranding that and providing that with the LibreOffice brand. Asking Nextcloud the opportunity to do the same, uh, putting it in the Univention uh, marketplace, um, maintaining and updated these on a monthly basis, the latest stable version um, there uh, for free. And yeah, um, I think there was another page there. One second, I probably mashed the, okay, yeah, uh, I've mashed the, the ordering. Okay, so. LibreOffice branded documentation and help files um, so to make it really easy to install um, and it'll be free and supported only by the community. And so, 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 so perhaps you can see the impact of the top pieces. There were some positive pieces as well. Like, you know, let me, let me, be, let me ba be balanced, you know, right? So, so there were some attempts then to solve some of the obvious problems here. Um, so supported only by the community, no paid support options from TDF. Okay, so... And the download page made clear if is Lul is used in enterprise environment support options uh, available through the ecosystem. So multiple people might be able to provide things. And at a later stage, limitations, actually there weren't any limitations at this stage, but, but pop, the pop-up I assume is what's meant. Uh, concurrent users and documents will be discussed. And the vote was pulled at the last minute. Okay, And I think Paolo will tell you that you only did it for promoting discussion and uh, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but from my perspective, it looked like you, could, you didn't have the votes to carry it that week. And it's hard to, you know, yeah. no, you didn't, didn't care. So, well, so, so that's fine. But at least as a business owner, when, when this level of change, let's call it, um, is, is proposed, um, then, then it's, it's difficult to, uh, to know where you go. And so, so let's just go back a bit to uh, some of the advice from the people that have done this and succeeded. So here's Bob Young. Um, he, he's, uh, you know, he, he's a great guy, I think. You know, I don't think any longer with Red Hat in the, in the thing, but here's what he said in his, his book, Open Sources. And I, I hate to read slides, but I'm actually going to read this to you. you know, how do you make money in free software? And I think this is a question that almost everybody asks me. You know? I say, we write software and we give it away. You know? No, well, okay. And they say, how do you make money doing that? And I'm like, that is a really good question. You know, like, I mean, honestly, that, that's the problem, right? No one expects it to be easy to make money in free software. And if I was in church, I would say, 
amen to that, brother. You know, and, I, and then you'd all go, yeah, but anyway. While making money with free software is a challenge, challenge is not necessarily greater than with proprietary software. In fact, you make money in free software exactly the same way as in proprietary software. You build a great product, you market it with skill and imagination, you build a brand that stands for quality and customer service, right? And I, I, I'm broadly with him. Problem is that we've already built a great brand, it's LibreOffice, and if the product, you, you, you are doing all the work to make the product, and someone else is marketing it at zero price with the skill and imagination and talent that TDF's marketing brings to it, your brand is not, <laughs> you're not gonna build any brand, any kind of brand that gets around that. And that's pretty serious uh, in terms of the ability to fund the fund thing. And ultimately, marketing is a science that is, is quite useful. It, it generates leads. If you don't have leads, your salespeople can't sell to anyone. Uh, you know. And when you sell things, you get money, and with that money, if you're Calabra, you make free and open source software. So the lead flow is ultimately fundamental to our business. Now, there are other ways to generate leads than, than um, you know, with, with branding the software and downloading it and offering free downloads and so on. But they're very expensive, and they don't necessarily work well. And you can read, I, I wrote for many years, I've written long screeds that no one reads, with pictures on, on, on why this is tough. Um, but conferences, direct mail, there are many, there are many ways, I mean, like spamming people can, can kind of work, hunting, you know, t targeting people. It's, it's extremely expensive, and it's very easy when your software is as cheap as our software is for the cost of sales and marketing to overwhelm anything that you can get back. And I think this is quite a fundamental problem in, in much of the software, free software that we have, is that we can't afford to market it. And you, know, you see this with Oracle DBAs. You talk to an Oracle DBA and you say, why don't you just use MySQL or Postgres? It's awesome. And they're like, hmm, but it's really cheap, right? So, so that will you know, diminish the whole value of everything that we do. Really, you know, like, I can't be a, if I'm a professional Postgres DBA, like the whole value of the, the licensing and the server stuff is, is, is so low that my large salary and you know, position as a DBA is, is sufficiently you know, it is, is diminished. And so they choose to use Oracle, which is incredibly expensive, like you can't believe. And this happens again and again. You know, so, so, so ecosystems are interesting. And, and yeah, anyway. So, yeah, marketing, marketing against our code that we wrote. I mean, like, our is kind of odd, but we, if we wrote it, we can claim perhaps it's ours. Uh, you know, as free as in beer is incredibly hard, and particularly against a, a LibreOffice community brand that's, that's very known and loved uh, by all of us. So, so the vote didn't uh, go through uh, for one reason or another. We decided instead to come up with a marketing plan, right? So that's a reasonable idea. If TDF is going to crush the lead flow that generates the software, then perhaps we should do something else to replace that. And that's not, you know, it's not, not a foolish idea, right? And so, as I understand it, one of the, the ideas was, you know, we take the leads from here that currently go to Calabra, and instead we replace all those leads going to TDF, and then, well, and then what? That's the question. So there are a lot of people who think that all of TDF's problems would be solved if only it was more diverse. You know, if only we had more companies, uh, you know, then, then life would be great. And there are a number of ways that that shows, and I'll show you one in a minute. Um, but then, assuming this is even legally possible, which was interesting in many ways, and we'll, we'll look at, um, where do you send the leads, right? So this is one of the, one of the questions. If, if, if leads are ultimately money, what do you do? So when we were last in Italy, perhaps in Rome, uh, October 2017, here's what was Capano's flyer said. What will Capano contribute to LibreOffice Online? And the, 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 the punchline are improved user interaction, package access, and sharing, sharing experience. You know, so we'll, we'll, we'll tell you how you can design your UI, and we'll package it available for free, and we'll share our experience. And Calabra had spent quite a lot of time recruiting Capano and visiting them and improving things for them and doing lots of work uh, for them. Um, and ultimately, they built these packages, and for a time, they were listed ahead of Calabra um, in the download page, in the uh, LibreOffice Online page. So if you went there, you might, casual, you know, as a casual user, you might think that Capano had contributed, you know, something, or that they were important. You know, there's, there's a listing and ordering there. And 
to me, that was that's pretty that's pretty staggering and astounding because when you look at it, actually there was very little code, let's say, uh, that went into uh, online from Capano, um, which yeah, which is odd. So so one of the parts of the marketing plan is you know where do the leads go? Like how do you make that fair? Like so, do you give them to Capano or not? Or is there some threshold? Or do you give people a chance when they start as you steer business left and right? How do you how do you do it, and on, on what basis, and for what goals? Um, and, and, you know, how do you make that stick? And in terms of legal risks, I'm not going to talk about legal risks in, in detail for TDF, but having a non-profit steering substantial business to one company or another company or, or anything is, is yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, really, it's really not easy, right? So, yeah, see, see but... These are sticking points that maybe could have been solved. I'm like, I'm, I go into these things with an open mind, you know. Um, but then the question is, when to start doing this? Should we should we immediately ship uh, free binaries at TDF or very rapidly ship them, and then just busk the marketing plan and hope it works when you can see the the negative impact is kind of obvious? Or should we try it first for LibreOffice and see if we can make the moral suasion work? Um, well. That was very uncertain. Destroying business confidence is really, it's really easy. And creating it is really hard. And perhaps if you, if you feel attached to your pension or, or something like that, you can understand why. Uh, that might be so, sorry, you know, I'm making a mess of it. Anyway, so ultimately, we lost confidence completely in the, the, the being a sensible outcome here, and we moved. Um, so you can argue why. But my, my claim is this, you know, it's really... a, a an opportunity to unpick lots of badness. And so it also allowed us to solve a number of the problems that people have complained about. So, you know, support SLA product management, fine, that's what we, we should have. Um, we made our binaries, unlimited binaries, uh, publicly available in a Fedora model. So, you know, you could get the development edition, um, and that development edition would have no limits. It would not pop up anything, it would not tell you you should get support at scale. Um, and we made all of our documentation public and how we can do our Docker images. So we, we chose to use brand awareness then to do that lead, lead generation and build a brand. So you can argue about forks, but essentially everybody came with us. So, you know, generally in a fork, you, you, know, you go along and then it splits into two prongs, right? I mean, my, my forks do, or maybe more, four sometimes. Um, if it only has one, I'm arguing it's a move, but I won't, I won't, uh, I won't hassle you about that. Ultimately, there were no commits uh, between the move being announced for two months. Um, there was a split vote as to whether to freeze it. The chairman's vote was a casting vote. And subsequently, we had this atticization process approved for putting things in the attic. Uh, and, and the fact that it could be moved back out again was an integral part of that with rules for that. The ESC ultimately voted in June. Um, they were given a week's notice, a heads up for this. There will be a formal vote next week and links to the proposals and so on. It was then discussed. Uh, there was a vote, which is very rare. The ESC almost never votes, uh, maybe five times in its existence. All of the Calabria and Allotropia people abstained from that, and it was passed effectively unanimously. And then there was a board decision, which was much less unanimous. Um, and it resolved to postpone formally articulizing online until, well, soon, I guess. And, and that's the result of the vote. Uh, but that at least gives a, a, a process for bringing it back. And some things sprung up at that point, I guess. So Andreas Manka was stimulated, I'd say, by the ESC uh, decision uh, to, to work on an updated LibreOffice Online. So you can see that in the Free Office Online repository on GitHub. Yeah, I mean, he took uh, the Collabor Online repository from 2022, all of the work we'd done in the last, I don't know how many years, uh, 18 months, 20 months plus there. And his first commit added this file as part of the LibreOffice project to all of the headers. Now, shoot, Paolo. Yes, so let me reflect on... Sure, so Paolo said that's the first thing we removed when, when it was no longer part of the LibreOffice project. Absolutely, right. And, and when you reflect on the trademark nonsense that we've had recently and the problems of claiming that something is LibreOffice when it isn't, um, I think it's, it's a little bit rich simultaneously to attack people for using the LibreOffice brand and also to s encourage other people to call something that isn't LibreOffice, LibreOffice. I find that hard to understand, but yes, fair enough. 
Um, there was also a renaming of number of files, changing of some strings, and he continued to take commits from Calabra, tweak them and merge them. Some people talk about stealing code from, I don't know who you're stealing it from, but um, I think it's interesting to, to have a balanced view on, on, on those things. Uh, there was some silliness here where uh, Andreas uh, changed a string in his, his fork. I mean, this clearly is a fork, although how much work is going on here really is unclear. Um, that broke, broke it, and then there was a big long thread on a board discuss, which you can read, but the punchline is it didn't break anything except Android and iOS releases, of which there were none uh, from that side. So hopefully this has all been resolved in the obvious way, just by having a, a sensible string. There's only one string that read cool in the LibreOffice core, and it now reads LOK, which stands for LibreOffice Kit. There's another alternative here, which is OX Office. So OX Office, uh, OSSII, which is, sorry, are primarily funded by uh, Taiwanese, well, I, I understand there's quite a lot of tiny Taiwanese government money there. I've long had a, their own fork of both LibreOffice and online, and uh, it's great that they're building their own brand around that. I think that's, that's kind of cool. Um, but it's hard to see what they're doing, and the base of the code is, is rather different. Uh, there's a lot of Chinese uh, or traditional Chinese, uh, commit messages in there. And there's a lot of this sort of stuff going on. You know, look at this activity, all of this adding caching of tunnel dialogues, um, which generally is thought to be poor style to uh, take other people's code and put your name on it. Um, so yeah, and, and I, I don't see a lot happening there. The base is a very old uh, base, so that, that really does start from, I think, even before the move, uh, they, they forked. They, they also checked the thing out and checked it in uh, they, they copied it and created a new Git repository, having changed it and checked it in. So it's very hard to diff one side to the other because you don't know what Git commit was the base and you don't know what was changed. And that's quite hard to do. I mean, you have to actually try to obscure the, you know, the origin of it in order to do that. But that's been done both for their LibreOffice fork and also their, um, their online fork. And they do contribute some things back. There are a few patches a year that come back. So I think this framing is probably maximally unfair and deeply polarizing. So I'd encourage you not to use that one. I don't think it's reasonable. Uh, we've put a fortune into writing Floss, and we contributed, you know, with, with lots of other people. And when pushed into a corner, in our view, we left. Uh, TDF is a community project, and if people show up and do good things, it, it goes well. So, you know, I think we should, you know, <laughs> not not try to use the uh, community brand to, uh, to destroy uh, the people doing the work. So here's another thing I hear, that we, we should have done something useful during COVID. Well, what we did during COVID was the move. So we had unlimited, easy to install binary packages, Docker images anyone can use. We had public set up an installation documentation, we removed this warning, and at the same time, we helped many schools and universities and companies to deploy it, and they fund development today. And of course, TDF can still hope, you know, promote what it wishes. And this is our footnote, really. I guess LibreOffice does rock. You know, it is, it is cool. It's an outstanding piece of software, and, and we love it, and we recommend and commend it to you. Italo came up with, as part of the marketing plan, this very useful LibreOffice technology unifying way of, 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 of showing this thing. I think it's an excessively helpful way of, of winning together. And we worked to credit LibreOffice technology um, and put this in there. It, it now even shows up, as I said earlier, in the thing. And we do community crediting, and we take that quite seriously. Uh, so we have good lists of translators and contributors and so on. And we carried on releasing new features and doing good, good new things. Nextcloud decided, as a vote of confidence, which is brilliant, actually, given the competitive situation in the market, to base on LibreOffice technology by default, which is cool. And so Nextcloud Office are, are using that. And of course, they use their brand. And that's just you know great. Um, and shoot. Nextcloud, yeah. uh, so half, how big are they? How big are Nextcloud? So if you look at the Docker image downloads, I think they have half a billion downloads of, of Nextcloud on the Docker. Oh, that's the Docker number you can see, I think. Um, now, not all of those have Collabor Online in them, or Nextcloud Office, but it's, it's certainly a, a great way to get our work out there and get people using uh, the LibreOffice technology, for sure. Um, so. The marketing plans. So the question is, we did do many changes to, to improve things to the marketing plan, and, they, and maybe they could have worked. I don't know. It's possible. Um, if you should be on TDF internal, there are many interesting things there. Do, if you're a member, do subscribe. But 
the punchline is that this didn't have any impact at all on our business. So on one stage, that's sad. Uh, on another angle, it's good that we didn't do radical changes expecting this to have an effect when, in fact, it didn't. So there we go. Where do we go next? So there are many things that we could do, and I'm sure you have more ideas, and do come and talk to me or you know, others afterwards. Um, there is this hungry school kids in Africa need free binaries concern, and that's fair enough. Of course, they can use code. TDF uses code. Or we can provide them with free binaries if, if that's particularly uh, important to them. Obviously, running Calabra Online needs a next cloud, a known cloud, a PyDOC file, file, blah, 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 right? And it needs hardware to run on. And clearly, someone needs to pay for the hardware. I don't think anyone's arguing we should give away hardware. Um, although maybe, maybe we could, perhaps that's an option. Um, if there are strategic accounts and people feel that they want to install something in their local school and they want that, just talk to me, we can, we can help you. Someone needs to pay something. We, we try and steer people to do that in many ways in, in LibreOffice software. My hope is that post-atticization, we can do a better job of promoting LibreOffice technology. You know, we like LibreOffice and we like to promote it. Um, so I think telling people about it more enthusiastically is certainly something we can do. Um, as we use the LibreOffice brand to tell people about LibreOffice, we need clear legal rules. And they have to be credible, trustworthy, and enduring commitments, which unfortunately, in the current world, is very hard for TDF to say and commit anything credibly. Uh, I think, yeah. Binding future boards is really hard, and getting boards to agree is hard, but it's possible that we can make some progress here. We try and use a fair use description of our software and fairly credit LibreOffice. And we should work more with the TDF marketing team because they're cool, and we can do case studies, and Libre we're a LibreOffice success story. We need to be uh, you know, telling people like that to try and create more LibreOffice success stories, it seems to me. This is another idea. We could have a new and more effective marketing plan that re-persuades people that they should pay for LibreOffice and use that to drive LibreOffice development. Uh, maybe. Uh, I think there's be a massive uphill struggle there, and that's not something I advocate. I don't want to go there again. Um, and furthermore, it's not clear to me that TDF is a good foundation to build a business on. I mean, if you look at the branding that CIB have had to change, uh, and and the, 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 the way that they've been treated, it's not clear to me that anything that brings leads and business into TDF and then TDF distributes it is stable or sensible. So another option is, hey, just take the hit. It doesn't matter. It's all nonsense. We should just give it away. Free as in beer is the key, and we should just give it all away now. You know. Uh, so uh, there are people that think that. Um, so anyway, thank you for listening. I'm afraid I've consumed much more time than I'd hoped, but we can discuss outside. Uh, yeah, like five, minutes. five minutes, okay, so, so we can have some questions. I, I hope you can see, well, maybe you can think about this as you sit there. It's unfortunately slightly cut off at the bottom. What, what do these companies have in common? Sun, Oracle, Smooth, Sousa, Cloud, on Ice, Warp, Capano. Anyway, so thank you for listening. You've been very patient. Thoughts, question. Oh, yeah, you can clap life. Go on. I've got a clack at the back. You know, they're very, yeah, well, excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Comments or, or thoughts? Oh, yeah. uh, do, do starving children in Africa need uh, an, an online version of the uh, uh, office productivity? Yeah, so, so possibly I slightly. So, do starving children in Africa need an online version of a productivity suite? So, so obviously I slightly caricature the, the perspective, right? Um, so, so let's say, you know, like there's a lot of quite wealthy people in, in third world countries uh, and in, in cities with infrastructure and maybe we should be compassionate to them and, and give them, them software. Uh, it, it's a viewpoint I hear regularly from people that it is our mission to close the digital divide as TDF and so we should do that. And, and that's, I don't want to diminish that argument. Um, and so the question is then, what do we do about that? H how do we do that in a way that doesn't destroy uh, you know, the, the software itself? I mean, there's no benefit in doing something today that means that we can't do anything tomorrow. <laughs> you know, like if we all deploy software that's then not sustained, uh, we have a problem. Does that make sense? It's something to think about. It is, and we should definitely think about that later. But I think it's, it's a real concern that some people have. And, and people have different views of what TDF's mission is. That we have a lot of goals. We have a big manifesto, and people like different parts of it and are attracted to different parts of that. And I think that's reasonable. That's why we have lots of 
you know, <laughs> different strands. The question then is how you reconcile it all and make everyone, well, make it work. Paolo, I'm sure you have a question or a comment or a... Am I totally unreasonable? I mean, I know I am, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Four, five, yeah, 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 go, go ahead. Yeah. So, so Paolo, like the beginning of the talk, I think is the punchline. <laughs> the technical, the technical details. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, the, I'll, I'll say the, 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 the first beat is, you know, was a uh, very, very nice. I uh, like, you know, actually the story, because, you know, I used to do a lot of stuff, similar stuff, many, many years ago. So the struggle to create a new technology just to, to innovate and, and that, that is just fantastic. So I, as I said many times, I really, really appreciate your your effort as a developer. You did actually great things. Yeah. So I always said that, and I naturally, I always said, I always said that I appreciate. Uh, what Collabora uh, is is doing. Uh, let's say that the rest of the story probably needs fine tuning uh, because there is one side, uh, and naturally we can't take hours and hours of conversation and the discussion we had to reach compromises to find a good way to uh, actually work on liberal official line together. But you know that is something that maybe we talk uh, we talk another time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I have 30 seconds. So, so le then let me just, just say that if you, if you read my slides carefully, the beginning bit shows that investment is what makes code. We, we had these ideas for a long time, but we had no money to do it. And that actually, the economics are what drive it. What the co what's in common between all these companies is that they all once invested in online LibreOffice, like this online document thing, and now none of them do. So the pe last people left standing are Calabra and, well, our partner network. Luckily, we've, we've tried to build economics that works. Anyway, thanks, Guilhem. That's, that's it. You've been very patient. Grab me outside if you want to carry on.